Welcome to the Infinite Musician Podcast. I'm Dan Weiss, creator and owner of M-File Music Theory and Songwriting. We are all about helping you gain control of your creative passion and power so you can become the musician you are supposed to be, making the most impact with your music by creating the music that you hear in your head. Yeah, you get the full, like, uh, flat post shower hair for this one. Oh this yeah, one. for sure. Hey, uh, it, it's greasy mountain man on my end. So I, just, <laughs> I find this, this really helps me from the temptation of going out and grabbing a drink and being like, everything's fine. Cause they won't let me in anywhere. They'll be like, shut along. <laughs> come on. <laughs> also, yeah, I guess bars are open there. Eh? So yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. Cause it's like, <laughs> You know, do we have a cure yet? And they're like, go drink. It's like, oh. It's like, that's not a cure. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, but I'm not going to. It feels it's- like a solution, but it truly isn't. <laughs> <laughs> a classic Simpsons quote. Alcohol, <laughs> the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, the extremely talented... Uh, multi-instrumentalist. That's a good uh, woodwind trick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Chelsea McBride. It's great to, to see you and chat with you again. Um, it's been quite a while, probably one of the last uh, Koopa Troop. Uh, oh yeah. It's been, it's been a couple of years for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I think, well, o- Orion was born because we did bring him to one of the last gigs you guys had. I think it was an After Funk show. I may not have been there. Um, I left the Koopa Troop in the beginning of last year, I guess. It's been about a year and a half since I played with them. But that's a fun stint, though. (laughs) Yeah, well, it was. I was really stoked that there was something like that that was finally happening that I could easily go to. I had access to the band members. I always knew when they were playing, there was a good chance we were going to be playing a show together. And it's just all hardcore, incredibly talented musicians playing classic retro video game music, which is like, (laughs) it's so much fun. And the video game music community internationally, which I've been lucky to get into partly through working with the Koopa Troop and partly through just knowing people and Mm -hmm. like being uh visible online um it's not a big community and for the most part it is super supportive and it is just super cool i've i've met uh only the best of people really through that and it's been a lot of fun um because everyone is so spread out um there's a lot of stuff that happens online and a lot of the discussion a lot of these friends i have it's all sort of living in these online spaces, which is really handy, especially now in the end times, (laughs) uh, (laughs) because there isn't really another way to, to share stuff. And it, it was also just really good for me. I like, I've been a nerd since I was a kid and I was really lucky to have good video game access when I was a kid. So I played a lot of the classic Mario games and like they were, you know, they were at my grandma's house and we went there after school or we had, I think my brother had the consoles in his room or we would have them in like the, the living room or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I was just really lucky to get into that music and all of, all of that really early on. And then I went to music school and that actually just didn't leave me enough time or money <laughs> when I was first breaking into the scene to like be a nerd. So after that, I was taking every opportunity I could to be in the video game world and like things have settled. I now own a switch. I am playing, oh, like I play yeah. PC games, best, but it took best a really Christmas long gift time ever. I was so happy to get one. <laughs> That's the first oh, time I've got it like a new console, yeah. like a current generation console in, I don't, probably since the 64, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, was, I was always one behind. Um, hmm. My uncle was super into it. And so we would get whatever console he like didn't have. But I also like, I dug the Atari out of our grandma's basement when I was oh, yeah. a teenager. And that was a really interesting experience. I've, I'm not like, I, I like to describe myself in the video game world as like very much a casual I, I don't have time. Yeah. Even, even in the end times, like I don't have time. So I really like diving into games that are it, like, it doesn't really matter the tone, but like a good art style that are like, they're fun. They're mm-hmm. like concise. They're, they have good stories and good music, or they're just like fun little romps that you can like pick up and put down. 
uh, Dead Cells being one of those that I haven't revisited in a while. I've heard uh, good things about Dead Cells. <laughs> and, and also, like, it's been, you know, five, six, seven years, and I now own Mario Kart again. So, like, all is right <laughs> with the world. Truly. Like. And another, uh, in terms of, like, music-related uh, soundtracks and stuff, like, a lot of the Super Nintendo games, like Squaresoft was the classic. They had such a good everything but i i always found that it was the soundtracks like with chrono trigger and the final fantasies and all that just these amazing sweeping scores but they would get so much depth to the game like it i feel like there was the better the music started getting it was more acceptable as a whole as an art form you know what i mean like it it, and it's it's so interesting to dig into the history of that too like like the first video game composers were like programmers as much as they were composers. Yeah. And then as the technology moved, you had um, opportunities to create more sweeping scores. You had more than eight tracks to yeah. work with or eight <laughs> things to work with, right? Um, and I, I think of it, especially like with the processing power that exists now, it's a lot more like, um, like a film score. And you're really mm-hmm. using that music to, to set the scene and to set the tone. Uh, which is why we're all programmed to like when when a little loading icon shows up or when the music changes, you're like, oh, it's a boss battle, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, we've had this like Pavlovian thing programmed into our brain, right? And, right. Uh, and so now we're like that too. But I I think it's it speaks a lot to like the people who were building these games in the first place to understand that like yeah, this is like sound reinforcement and creating this immersive world. Like that's so important too, right? Well it was so, it, it was like an extension of uh, the medium of film, but yeah. it's you get to play it. So naturally film and music go a lot hand in hand. So it's the next reasonable extension of it as well to have really good music. So like yeah. there was people that didn't really try. We know that, you know, there's some absolute diarrhea on the Nintendo, but at the same time, there's some really, really good, like Mega Man, all the Mega Mans have incredible music. Um, the games aren't always good, but anything Tim Follin does, that's, that's a serious composer right there. And I feel so bad for the guy because he's written some of the best video game music and most of the games are garbage or like stupid untouchable like silver surfer you know it, whatever. yeah but that's such an interesting thing because i i think that also i mean the thing that i find really cool about the video game music world too is that like as as someone who holds like a bachelor's degree in music i am actually i'm kind of a minority or that's that's not a thing that happens <laughs> to everybody and and like it really speaks in a way to like yes yeah, school school's great like that kind of like formal training is cool but it doesn't, it's not the be all end all. You could still make good music without it. And oh, I, and I feel sure. like that about anything that involves like a really large team where like you can have really good people in a room and the alchemy just doesn't work sometimes where yeah. like maybe the music is great, but the, the game is super janky or just something doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to. But then you can have people that are not like good or trained or whatever your construct is here and it can come together and make something that is so much bigger than the sum of its parts and i mean that's a good band or a good orchestra Absolutely. right Absolutely. one person can drag the whole thing down but if you get everyone working together and really being a part of that collective then you get something that is better than everybody's best i think that's that's absolutely true i mean like i i love a good paul mccartney record but i will take you know abbey road hands down any day. Yeah. You know, it's like (laughs) all of them were musical geniuses, but when you could get them to at least face in the same direction, you had a masterpiece. Yeah. (laughs) But, um, so on the topic of the video games thing, cause I know I kind I've, I've talked to a lot of people where it's like, they get into music and like in this age, it's like, what got you into it? And some of the first real exposure to music was the video games in a lot of ways. Like there's the music that's playing on the radio, the parents, you know, like I had really good music growing up with like classic rock and Motown stations all the time in my house. So it was like a really good foundation to have. But when you're sitting and playing a video game, like six, seven hours in the day on a Saturday and your parents are yelling at you to get outside, you're internalizing the music too. Yeah. And I think there were a lot of, um, almost like complicated song forms or embellishments and things that I was internalizing as a kid. 
without really realizing it. And then when I went to start playing music, it was all kind of there programmed. Like, would you say you had kind of a similar stepping into the world of music? No. Um, Video games are definitely a part of it. Um, But I feel like that whole nerd side of me doesn't necessarily live in the same space as music. It's nice to put it all together. It's compartmentalized a little bit. (laughs) I, when I was a kid, my dad was on the radio. Like he was, he was a DJ for a little while. He's, he was in radio for a really long time. Um, and my parents are both music lovers. So it's a similar story to yours in that sense. I was just always around music. It was a lot of country when I was a kid, actually. Um, and a little bit of like, uh, Motown and some of the classics like I, I'm blanking on a bunch of stuff because I am deeply in the middle of a Christmas project right now and so I'm thinking <laughs> of like oh it's like the Eartha Kid version of this Christmas tune or the Eurythmic version of this, yeah. of this Christmas tune or like Stevie Wonder or <laughs> right but I got into to pop music Ultimately, Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of like the triple A format in radio. Don't ask me what it stands for, but it's like the kind of stuff that you would hear on boom here in Toronto or like the, the sort of greats of the seventies and eighties and nineties. That's the stuff that I like knew. And then I got into jazz in high school, but I also in tandem with all of that, I took music lessons from when I was really little, I was two or three. Um, and I've been in lessons basically like that was all I did in school or outside of school. I took piano lessons. I took voice lessons. I eventually started taking saxophone lessons. I played in band. I was like, uh, doing honor bands and stuff like that outside of school. I managed to get into grade 12 and take like half non-music classes and half music classes. That's Um, pretty lucky. (laughs) I was pretty lucky. I switched schools to pull that one off, but um, not without a lot of, it was hard. It was a hard decision to make, especially yeah. to switch for your last year. And, you know, I was like 17. I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> but, but I, I mean, figured you, that much out. Right. You, you and, put that much into it at that point that yeah. it, you know, like a lot of people when they're like, you know what, I want to try and go and do like for me going and doing music school. Um, like it was more, I started playing guitar when I was 15, 16. Mm-hmm. But like, that's relatively late kind of in the game. And I was playing it more for me. I got to take guitar classes in high school, but it was like a last minute decision. All, all of a sudden I was like, you know what? I'm skipping class to play guitar with my buddies in the parking lot anyway. Like yeah. might as well go and try music school and do that. And it was like, I feel like that's the two, there's two camps of like people who are like, you know what? Fuck it. I'll just try it. And there's people who have been like, <laughs> groomed and trained into like music machines like you like I feel like that was a really good like lot to to kind of fall into like was it ever a thing where you were like in diapers still and like I want to play the saxophone and they're like okay I had no yeah. idea I wanted to play the saxophone when I, was in diapers. <laughs> I, I can't guarantee you that much um I feel like for me it was a lot of I think a lot of people have an aha moment and that's one of the things that comes up in a lot of interviews. Like what was your aha moment? When did you decide to do music? It's like, it was the only thing I was doing and it was (laughs) the only thing I was good at. And it's been nice as an adult to like go back and rediscover stuff that I had an interest in. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause I found that being in school full time for four years really uh, took away from that. And I mean, there's other uh, life stuff too. And, you know, we don't need to get into my bad dis- dating decisions on a podcast, but Absolutely like <laughs> everything plays into it. You're not like, you're not a person in a bubble, but I really did feel like for, for the duration of my music degree, it's like I was in school and I was a student and then I got out of school. And of course you have to be a person. And so there's it's been a lot. hard adjusting. That's a, there's been a it's lot. such a weird thing stepping out into the real world again after music school and being like, oh shit, there's more. Than, there's more than just this thing that's consumed me for four years. Like, <laughs> and like I, I had, I was fine through high school, but I got injured in first year, like playing, like just strain injuries from playing saxophone. Yeah. And so it got to the point where it's like, okay, yeah, this is my like pride and love and joy. And I compose as well. Like I play a bunch of different woodwinds, but like my body literally will not let me play for eight hours a day. Yeah. And I can't be at a computer for eight hours a day. I do that. (laughs) It's not to say this doesn't happen, but like, 
I feel it. And video yeah. games are also in that land of like stuff you do with your hands. That's going to like, like I'm getting too old now. I say old, I'm, I'm not 30 yet, <laughs> but like <laughs> not even 30. And I'm, I'm already, you know, like the parts of my shoulder, like click and crunch when I move yeah. them. And like my ankles are actually, I'm not a, a very cracky person, but if, if I were, my ankles would be a symphony, right? Like you just, <laughs> you start to, to not even like wear out in a bad way. It's just like my, my body decided a long time ago that it, it's lazy. It doesn't want to do this. Stuff. And like <laughs> I exercise and I feed it and I tell it that I love it. Right. And we all have these differing relationships with our body, but for mine, it's like, you can't just do one thing. No. And that's really nice because my brain wants to do one thing. My brain has always been like, I want to be a musician. This is my only career path. This is the only thing I'm good at. And leaving music school and being like a, like a real grown up. <laughs> has really been a study in like, okay, but what else can you do? <laughs> right. Who else are you? Like, what are you as this person when you're not making music or when you don't have an instrument in your face? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a really intense time because it's so consuming and it feels like you're going to literally burst into either tears or flames at any given moment through several years. But then you get out and you realize like, they were doing as much of it as they could in a short amount of time because you're not going to be able to focus like that when you get out. Yeah. And you know? by necessity, like there, as much as I am very much one of those artists who's like, this is my calling. This is my passion. It's my career. I get to put all these things in the same, I get to put all these eggs in the same basket. I guess that's the idiom. Um, <laughs> but like also like you have friends and family and partners. You have kids. Like, yep. <laughs> this is a whole, that's, that has nothing to do with music. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you can't share that and love that and have that be a part of like a big part of your life. But yeah, you get out of school and it's like, oh, okay. Like this can't be my only personality trait. No. Anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it was good enough to loosely hold together your associations in school, but it's like, you know, once you're out, you're out there and you're yeah. going to go your separate way and you got to make your own way. Cause it's like, yeah. it's you, you have it, it. I notice like music school has the same kind of traits as like say partying or addiction or anything like that, where it's like you create an environment where everyone's kind of like, this is what's happening. So you just normalize it. And so everybody's talking about like facets of the Lydian chromatic concept and like, Oh, what, what can we do with this? And that just becomes your regular, a regular afternoon or like talking about like ripping apart types of approaches to solos over chords or whatever. And then you leave and you, you lose that, you know, <laughs> like it, it's like, it's not okay to just approach a random person and be like, Hey, uh, can you give me some, some approaches on like your instrument? I'm doing an arrangement and I'm wondering how you approach a sharp five in this kind of situation. And they look at you like you're, you're fucked. <laughs> well, it depends who you're talking to, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But you're not going to walk out of a door and run into literally anybody who would engage in a conversation like that with you. So it's like, it's good and bad in that way where it's like, it, it kind of coddles you into thinking there's always going to be this kind of time and this kind of situation, but it also is like really good for developing that kind of thing and, and maybe pushing you to seek out that kind of connection after the fact to kind of move you forward as a musician, you know, like you don't want to get stale or get too comfortable in, I have a life and I'm too busy and I don't want to, but then you don't progress. You know what I mean? There's, like it's, there's a lot there. Cause I think that like one of the selling points and the deepest flaws of music school is the pressure cooker. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're sort of speaking at an interesting time, like in the wake of call it movements around black lives matter. Right. And right. I think it's important, um, to know, I mean, like I've been following all the, this is art school stuff, which comes out of Toronto and Montreal and has been, uh, deeply opening to see the level of just like embedded discrimination that happened in music school, in art school right. in a lot of ways. And when you're in that sort of pressure cooker environment and you're not made to feel super welcome, which I mean, is a thing that happened to me very early in my Humber days. Uh, it's, it's hard, right? right? On top of trying to just be good at your craft and trying to learn and trying to find your people, you are surrounded by stuff that maybe doesn't help your learning. 
right? That right. isn't going to help you be a better person. And then you get out and it's like, okay, now you have time to breathe and think about these things, but you haven't put any effort into it for four years. And I think there is something to be said for the immersion in just like music, music, music. Um, and I think that's really powerful. And I think it's really important having done, um, you know, summer camps and stuff like that, like little workshops where you, you get a week or two or maybe sometimes more. And that's all you do is you're really focusing on like getting a set together for a little end of week concert or just like deepening your, your practice and your craft. And that is the thing that institutions are really good at is giving you the space and the time and the focus to do that and very little else. Um, But I think the trade-off is that like, yeah, you, you forget all the other stuff and it gets hard to sort of come back out there and be like, okay, I'm a musician, but I'm also this. And yeah, you're not going to be able to talk about the Lydian chromatic concept, which is a book none of the people talking about it have read. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's out of print. <laughs> like, it's like $800 on Amazon because it's like, yeah, yeah. You need to be a certain age and very rich to have actually read that book. So yeah. anyone who talks about it that is our age is talking nonsense. I get right? some really good watered down articles about the general ideas and I like to throw <laughs> it around like money on the table. You know, and, <laughs> and I think that like in that sense, one of the challenges in school and out of school, right, is who do you surround yourself with? Because I've definitely I've been pretty lucky growing up in Vancouver and then moving out here. Mm-hmm. I have friends on, you know, I would say both coasts, but we all know that Toronto is the center of the universe <laughs> and has no so coast says to Toronto. The, the lake does not count. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have strong feelings about how incorrect all of these assertions are. Right. But, <laughs> but the point is that like, there's so much research out there psychologically about like how you are in a sense, the sum of the people that you surround yourself with, this gets tagged to weight, but it's also tagged to like lifestyle and mm-hmm. habits and, and things like that. And I think that musically, it's a really interesting thing. And it's something that I've looked at in my friend circle as I've uh, grown up. Like I, uh, I just started dating a really lovely man. And one of his first things when I started introducing him to my friends was like your friends are so cool. Like your friends have this thing going for them. And that to me was like, I think probably the first time that I've heard it said, uh, which is nice. I like my friends. I know they're great. Um, getting an outside perspective. It's like, yeah. Oh, and getting okay, an outside good. perspective that's like, they're <laughs> supportive They're mm-hmm. If you go to them with something and you know, like I get a lot of free emotional labor from my friends and conversely, I give it as well because Mm -hmm. that's a thing I can do. But like, I've seen the community sort of rally in that like like, sort of small informal way. And I have groups of friends that are really cool to talk about uh, music stuff with, but also like uh, hockey or Mm self-care or gestures at everything, this world that we currently live in yeah. that is, you know, <laughs> 18 weeks into lockdown here in Toronto, it's all fine. Nothing could possibly get <laughs> Right. And, and it's made, it has made the last 18 weeks easier knowing that there is a group of people that I have met mostly through the music industry and mostly, mostly, but not entirely through school, uh, a lot through friends of friends. Mm-hmm. And this community is really sort of banding together and just like, we need to protect each other. Let's be cautious. Like, Let's be honest about our struggles. Let's talk about all the ways in which this is a huge deal. Let's talk about ways we can go back to gigging safely. Let's like, yeah, it's not it's, necessarily that this is the topic of conversation all the time, but the willingness to have that chat is there. Yeah, uh, that that's the one thing that it surprised me and didn't about yeah. how, because, you know, like your, your Facebook uh, friends and everything, it's like the, the, the close circle of people that you usually see or hear from or whatever. So when things started, you know, falling apart, it was amazing to see how much positive stuff I was able to have counteracting all the garbage that was going on because of everybody I knew from music and exactly how you were saying, it's like, it's, they're talking about ways that they can get through it. They're constantly checking in and just throwing out blanket posts to be like, Hey, if anybody needs to talk, message me. And there's, there's a lot to be said for, you know, the experience of the musician, like as an individual is a journey and it is battering and you go through a lot. So it it helps you hopefully become a bit more self-aware. So I saw this kind of in action as things were going wrong for everybody 
all these musicians were standing up in whatever way they could and being like, I got this, I'll help putting together groups where there's, there's performances and playing for people and doing all kinds of things just to be like, let's just remind each other that we're still connected because yeah. that connection is so important and we understand that it's important because we know what it's like to be lonely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, it was and, cool. and we work from home. We spend a lot yeah. of time in our little boxes practicing like the yeah. fundamental thing of like, do you want to be good at your instrument? You need to practice. Even if you only do it for an hour a day, like this is still, that's a lot of time that we get to spend by ourselves that other people don't spend in their offices or at their jobs. Right. Like uh, there are a lot of people out there who have been alone with your thoughts can be very yeah. scary if you're not used to it. <laughs> I I have been telling all of my friends with like, I'm going to use very heavy air quotes on this real jobs, <laughs> but like people who, who don't have that sort of artistic bent to what they do, where they're, mm -hmm. they're required to be alone and to be really in the details and to be really in their head. Um, those are the people who've all been cracking under the pressure. Yeah. Right. And so when I talk to my friends about stuff like that, it's like, okay, first of all, welcome to my Tuesday. Have fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> second of all, right. There are ways we can deal with this. And because like one of the things that I got really into after school, um, you know, like young kid, not really knowing how, what to make of all this free time, <laughs> uh, got really into productivity and efficiency and yeah. like all the stuff around work motivation and stuff like that. I've also like, I have my own mental health struggles. So that's a big part of why I look into all this stuff because uh, sometimes depression brain kicks in or hormone brain kicks in. Absolutely. And it's like too bad you're in bed. <laughs> What you yeah. gonna do? So when I'm feeling good, I want to I want to be like there, right? Absolutely. I want to be yeah. really good. Um, and one of the things that that taught me is like, yeah, you you actually need to give yourself that time to be alone with your thoughts, sure, but also to like cope with big things or big stressors as they happen. To like at, like read before bed, like to not be looking at your phone. These little ways that we can build pauses into our day to sort of adjust because then when everything else is on fire, what you have within yourself, this is going to sound so wishy-washy, is this like this like nice little warm, safe place. Yeah. And, and that's a really important thing to have. And it's doubly important when you're in the arts and you're already super insecure. <laughs> <laughs> and your brain doesn't like you all the time. And, well, then... <laughs> and also like your, your art is a product of you. It's coming through you. It's coming through your lens of perception. So like you need to keep your mind and your body focused and ready and able to communicate that as best as possible. Yeah. You know, you, you, you want to be able to really capture something, you know, if, if you're, if you're off, if you're just kind of phoning it in because you're not, doing the, the steps and taking care of yourself, then your art suffers and, uh, you know, you suffer as a, as a result of your art suffering. And then the people who are like looking forward to it, there's people out there that you could be making an impact with your art that aren't going to quite get it, you know? So yeah. it's like, what, what, um, what would be part of like the system that you go about? Cause like, whether it's any kind of project, that's going on on any given day, there's usually some kind of way that you would approach sitting down, right? Like getting yeah. a system or a process going, like you obviously will have like your own workspace probably. That's like, this is designated and this is what happens. I have many opinions on this because on top of just like being a productivity geek, I also have, uh, I've lived alone. I've lived with roommates. I've lived with partners. So I have sort of the experience of like having to navigate space. Right. Um, I cannot advocate strongly enough for separate workspaces. Yes. Separate <laughs> spaces. If you live, especially like if you live with people who are also arty and who also need their space to do things, you cannot share space. Yep. You can, there's a way to sort of like share parts of your space for different purposes. Like, you know, if there's a, like a practice room, that's actually my current setup here is we, we have two musicians in the house most of the time. And so we have a shared practice room uh, that we sort of balance between, I would also teach out of there, but mm -hmm. then all of our other stuff happens in our own rooms. Right. Um, I think that like beyond that also, I'm a, I'm sort of like the chaotic influence in all of this to get into like <laughs> role-playing terms. Uh, I, I don't have like a system or a schedule per se, but I have ways of organizing and I have, uh, things that I do to sort of signal to my brain, like, okay, it's work time. Right. Um, and I think 
that in lieu of like, some people are very much like I wake up at 7am and I play my long tones and then I go do this. And it's like, that's great. I'm never awake at (laughs) 7am. You want to rise with the birds? Like go do your thing. I, I support you. I come from a family of morning people. So like (laughs) I, I'm usually awake when, when people get up and like, even here I'm the last person awake and that's fine. That, that just is what it is. Yeah. Um, but it is way less connected to time for me uh, and way more about like, okay, I'm going to get up today and like usually breakfast and tea. And then that's when my work day starts. Right. Um, I'm a big believer in having my space set up a certain way. I'm actually like this close to tweaking it again, which is the thing I do probably like two or three times a year when I get bored. Right. Um, and I've been staring at the same setup for 18 weeks and it blocks my window. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> this needs to change, but I also like how it's set up. Right. Um, And so it it becomes sort of an evolving process Um, in a time like this where I don't have as much work as I normally do. Things aren't as crazy busy or it's a lot looser. I actually give myself more structure. Mm -hmm. So I have daily to-do lists. They're pretty specific. I have more little things that I try and sneak into each of my days. Um, But when it's really busy, that gets cut down and it's like, okay, do the absolute essentials. When you need to sit down and like send this email, like make yourself a nice little cup of tea and like sit down, like, you know, I'm a really big believer in just like getting yourself into that mood. And that's not always about like part of it is about how your workspace is set up and making it efficient, making sure everything you need is within reach, yes. making sure that it looks good, like that things are pleasing. I have this is like my bedroom and it's very eclectic and weird right now, but it makes me happy. This is probably the most decorating I've done in a long time. Um, when you go into a space that makes you feel happy or productive or both, ideally, Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to get more work done. And if your tools are close at hand, you'll feel a lot better about it. Uh, So it's it's really just like setting yourself up for success and then also taking certain temptations away. Uh, (laughs) Like because I came in, my phone is right here, but normally it's plugged in on my bed. So I have to get out of my chair to reach it. Right. That's that's smart. (laughs) Yeah. And it does sit next to my bed, which is also not entirely advisable. If you're like going super by the book, your phone is in another room, but none of us do that because we're millennials and these things are attached to us. So like (laughs) we'll, we'll post a meme that says it, but we'll never actually do it. Yeah. (laughs) It's all about keeping up appearances. (laughs) It's such a practice of getting into that. Having, um, a space finally, like that's been a challenge for me, obviously with like two kids and a partner and living in traditionally very small apartments. (laughs) It's it's harder to find that space. So having the, it's like a tiny room and there's a closet. So it's like door and then there's a bit of a a closet. We need to talk about this. (laughs) It's like full of, like boxes and bags of cables and cases and stuff. It's like music yeah. stuff that I'm not using at the moment. So it goes over there. And then I've got <laughs> my guitars finally hung up on the wall. Yeah. So I don't have to put them away when I'm not using them. Cause that is such a big deterrent. If something pops in my head, I can literally reach right here and grab a bass or a guitar or whatever. I've got the yeah. keyboard right here. Like, it's like workstation for editing. I've got the mixer. I've got everything on here. It's like supreme studio, but also office. And then I have yeah. my entire video game collection right here. <laughs> and every system is hooked up in a shelf, like right beside. And I Ooh. run all these cables into my computer so I can just like play. Anything. I love this because it's like ease of music and ease of gaming all in yeah. the same setup. I actually do have to leave this room to get to the video games. Yeah. <laughs> well, so. it's, it's also because um, I was doing like streaming on Twitch for a little while, just because I was like, right. if I want to um, do this, I want to be able to be creating content, but also play video games and not feel guilty about it because I have a baby. <laughs> So it's like yeah. combining all of these things. I can talk about music and interact with people. Like I hopefully will be able to get that kind of going again soon, but it's yeah. just kind of a way to create more content and talk with people and play video games and talk about video games as well. So it's like yeah. merging all the lines of the things I like to do in a way that's <laughs> productive. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And sometimes that's what it is. I mean, like it's for people who work in 
industries where it's like, it's entertainment. It's not productive. It's like, no, there's work that goes into this. Like you still have to, you still have to work. You're allowed to enjoy the video games you play as you make them. But like, just as you're allowed to like, enjoy this piece of art that you're making, like we got, we always, there's always a project curve and I'm like, fully in the low spot of it right now but that's just like the wave that comes with it right. where you get to a point you're like oh this is really cool i'm super excited this is really starting to sound great oh but it's super derivative someone's done this before i really don't think i'm writing it my best i've definitely stolen this from someone but this is really cool and it doesn't matter because i'm gonna make it original <laughs> like <laughs> this keeps going <laughs> the important part of that curve I, I'm glad that you brought this up because you have that initial like adrenaline of something new and then you start ragging on it and then so many people stop right here. Yeah, getting through that low is- You have to push. That's such a big, because then you finish and even if some of this stuff was true and it's coming <laughs> from like a place in reality and it's not just all saboteur in your head, yeah, there's still like, you just, you got to finish it. And you can fix it yeah. when it's done, but just get it done and like have that accomplishment. That's like a huge, huge, huge thing that I really want to try and instill because like I keep throwing out hooks and asking questions and being like, what do you have problems with? And a big one is just finishing songs. And that's such <laughs> a trap, right? Cause like it just happens when you start working for this. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's always the shiny new thing. And something else happens or you get busy or whatever. But it's like, if you just put in an extra fucking 15 minutes and you get it done, <laughs> like just, and then, then it'll be done. And then you can fix it and change it however you want. But I don't know. Like, I, yeah, I, it, this is an interesting one for me because like in, in the process of growing up, I've also had to come to terms with the fact that I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm, I'm not about certain things. Mm -hmm. And one of them is definitely like in the creative process where it's like, oh, this is super derivative. It's not very original. You're definitely just like stealing for something else here. Right. Um, that sort of like pessimism can be a really useful voice in the revision process Mm. because it means you have to look at something and it, I, teach this as like, it has to pass the bullshit test. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But it really does. It has to, you have to be able to like listen to something and be like, okay, maybe it's like the worst thing is true about it, but also does it serve the piece? Um, Or does it serve the intention of this? This is how I feel about like a lot less music actually and more like visual media, video games and movies and TV shows is you can really tell, especially like in this Netflix era of the 58 minute episode, Mm -hmm. like a lot of that is filler. Oh yeah. (laughs) Sometimes you need it. Sometimes just because like, it's 58 minutes doesn't three. mean it's epic. <laughs> and, and I think we're losing that sense of like concise, well-constructed art. And when I look at pieces now, especially pieces that start getting really long, it's like, does it need to be? And the answer is usually yes. <laughs> <laughs> does it need to be this long? Um, I will like set out to write short pieces and mm-hmm. they'll just be like, Mm -mm -mm. you need three minutes to develop the statement. It's like, really? (laughs) Really? Because it was like three seconds of material in my head when I started. (laughs) Well, that's, that is a good thing because I was actually just working on some articles and stuff today that was kind of touching on motific development and that idea of working on a melody and, um, you know, the, like, starting simple and going and going with it. Right. Cause there's yeah. the, the idea, the original idea of like melody or hooks or whatever, it's, it's supposed to be a theme. Like if we're going all the way back to like classical music and how a theme or a motif runs through the entire orchestra and a symphony and, and, and it, and it comes back and it changes, changes key for an effect or a mood. It'll change, yeah. um, like go from major to minor in a certain part like that, you know, and it's, it's that idea that this one small thing grew into this big thing. And it's therefore this tying force, it's all connected. You don't have to throw a bunch of different ideas and have one big, long, complicated melody to make it, Oh, it's the best. It's so good. And this is our thing, right? Artists get 
pigeonholed as being like flaky or like all over the place. And it's like, we're idea people. This Mm -hmm. is what we do. We are creative types and learning that instinct to finish things that that is a learned or taught or like you don't, you don't start like that, (laughs) you know? And I think one of the interesting things is that you also see a fair subset of artists that are like, I start a thing and then I get really anxious, but I have to finish it because I will be anxious if it's unfinished and if Mm. it just hangs. (laughs) Um, And I mean, I'm not here to say there's like a right or wrong way to the process, but I'm very much a finisher. I like, I don't actually start a whole lot of, new things i i do a lot of things but i don't run all that many and the stuff that i do start it's very much like it's usually pretty well thought out before i put pen to paper like when i make records the track sequence is already there which is something Mm. that not a lot of other artists do because i know i need to know what the contour of it is before i go into it and if i'm filling in pieces of the story or something like that like a lot of i've learned also to have room for the details to change and shift and for the sequence to move around because that's just that's also sort of part of the game like yeah. it just happens you it's not going to go exactly the way you planned but the thing that i've really that that like i just do is it it all needs to be there before i really get too deep into it because mm-hmm. that's where i tell if an idea has legs and if i can build an hour long symphony out of three notes or right <laughs> right or if you can score a video game in one key entirely super mario brothers yeah. <laughs> like um incredible that's probably all the notes they had right like this is 1985 that's true. they could only game work programming was in different that then. there was no space we put too many blocks in so we had to cut out most of the musical choices you can make <laughs> yeah everything's in the key of c is it not brilliant though like it is that well, sometimes change. working with a constriction like that actually makes you more creative than if you just had a blank page to start with. If you're yeah. coming at it from solving a problem, then you're turning on different parts of your brain that are potentially more creative, right? Like, I, I'm sure there's, I mean, no, I don't want to say like school assignment type stuff, but in that kind of way, you know, because like, nobody's super excited for jazz harmony listening to everybody's songs all the all day. Like that's not yeah. necessarily like this is the best day ever. You get a few good ones that are like, Fuck, that was pretty surprising. But usually it's just like, yeah. I'm kind of happy that the onus isn't on me to like pay too much attention or I'll flunk the next <laughs> test. But I mean, it, that's sort of the cool part is to hear everybody's process too, mm-hmm. right? Because like the way that they're interpreting, this is the thing we grew up in school systems, like, kids go to school from a very young age and then, you know, we get sent out to the world as adults. And increasingly that's happening later and later because people go back and they do second degrees. They stay in school so that they don't have to worry about their loans or, you know, like we're, regardless of how you feel about how this came to be and the systemic factors, like this is kind of what's happening. I finished school at 22. I went straight in from high school. Um, Whether that was, it was the right decision for me. It probably isn't for a lot of other people. Um, but like, we're used to that sort of box and structure. Like I still Mm -hmm. haven't been out of school for longer than I was in it. Right. (laughs) So, I mean, that's a long time. And I think giving yourself parameters, like, again, there are artists that work very well in chaos and like thrive and mess and for sure. And all these things. I'm not one of those people. So I'm definitely not the person to talk to about it, but also like having parameters, having a story, having a, you know, a thesis statement, a purpose, a sentiment, having something to govern or to ground the piece of art you're working on making, regardless of its length, regardless of its intention, right? Like having something there that's like, this needs to be the founding principle. That's really, really useful in terms Mm -hmm. of like getting you to the end of a project, but also in terms of passing that BS test and seeing what actually makes sense here, right? If well, you're it's doing like having like, a checklist at the end where it's like, did I hit all the things that make this a project? You know, and it's, oh, it's complete. We've got all these things. It's, it's helpful to know when you're done. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because like sometimes that comes through as you're making the project, right? As you're doing it. Um, one of uh, one of my pieces on my last record, Aftermath, is about the space between will you marry me and the answer to the question. That's that's the entire thesis statement of this piece. It's mostly like very sweet and very thoughtful, but there's this chord shape that came into my head that shows up a bunch of times. And it's it 
and then often it's accompanied by a long pause. Um, and it's this big suspension and it's just like, what is the answer? Right. And that's this way of sort of coming back to the theme. And then at the end of it, you get this very big triumphant, like the answer is probably yes. I have more (laughs) thoughts on that, but the piece is a standalone. That's sort of the idea. And so every element that goes into that piece, including like who my soloists were, um, like I, I picked, uh, I guess now one married man and one engaged man in my band, because they were both like very, you know, they're, they're lifelong people. That's, they're, they found their person. That's, that's their person forever. And, and they're super open and honest about it and their partners are great. Right. And to just have that sort of like very pure hearted love is not a thing you see a whole lot these days. Yeah. Cause, and I mean, not necessarily by anybody's fault. Everyone has their drama, but it's such a beautiful thing. And of course, well, and those are the that, stories that I want. Yeah. <laughs> to take that and use that as the record. You know, like it's, it's your song that's setting this up, but then for a soloist, that's a very personal expression and interpretation of what's happening. So using those themes like that, that's really, that's really good though. Like, you know, it's like, tell them this story. They're going to go to that moment and they're going to relive that. And that's going to come out in the playing. And that's like, that's really cool. I, I think it's fun because also like, it's not like that's the story you need to have. That's not a prerequisite for playing that no. solo, right? But if you have that depth of perspective and a big thing for me working with my band is always like, you don't need to get the finer details. Like it doesn't need to be this story, specific story that you're thinking of, but I'm super open with my bands, especially when the tunes are coming from personal places. I'm like, this is what it feels like. Here is your material right? When you play these parts or when you play these motifs, like if you're going to solo over the section, this is your character. This is your, you know, this is your sort of sentiment. This is the thing I want you to be thinking of. Um, With that piece in particular, Love is on the Line, it was like, this is your montage. This is the montage of your relationship from the beginning to where it is now. And like um, in another piece that I do, uh, I wrote a piece about bipolar mania and so it was like okay so what are the symptoms of mania I was like I know what it feels like and it feels like this to me but also um this is what you could draw from that I don't necessarily have personal experience with but shows up in other variants of bipolar disorder or shows up more drastically Mm -hmm. um if we've done pieces about like science fiction and it's like no you don't need to have seen season three episode four of Battlestar Galactica (laughs) but that's essentially right it's like some of it is very specific and very niche and very small and some of it is is a lot more sort of sweeping and expanding and like um or aspirational in some ways and the idea when I tell these stories to my band and I'm telling them sort of what their characters are and who I want them to be and these roles I want them to play it's not like you have to be this person it's like I want you to take this and put your own spin on it and then right. bring it back. And that translation process going from like, this is my image of a thing I've never experienced because I'm 28 and <laughs> like out into the world uh, of like someone who actually does know what they're talking about, does know what aging is like. It is, you know, and just has a different perspective than me. Like mm-hmm. that translation process is what makes, that's the alchemy of the band. That's what makes the art. Right. Yeah. Cause I don't have their stories and, they have bits of mine and then we get to bring it together and it makes something cool. So with, with the band, is it still, are you still doing with socialist night school? Is that, yes. So yeah. I run, I, I run three projects. I have a trio called the Chelsea McBride group, mostly covers jazz standards. Uh, oh, I miss that. I miss all of this. Yeah. Uh, I have a pop jazz sex tech called Chelsea in the cityscape. Uh, all our stuff's right, on right, Spotify. Right. We have two EPs and a full length album. And I have a 19 piece big band called Chelsea McBride socialist night school. That's when I've been talking about our last record, I'm talking about aftermath, which came out on November 1st last year and is all about conflict in its various forms, internal, interpersonal, collective, societal. Um, it starts with a piece about the 2016 U S election. Ah, <laughs> Conflict, and continues eh? downhill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's really, um, well, uh, the first word that comes to mind is impressive that you're able to get 19 musicians. Yeah. Historically very flaky people in <laughs> on a project and commit to it. 
Like one of my favorite pictures um, from from the last little while in your in your news feed was was the picture of everybody crammed on that plane when you guys were off doing the the show, and it was it was a a really insane thought because it's like I've seen you guys on stage, I've I've seen this stuff, but like the fact that you guys are all on a plane and everybody's happy because they know they're getting taken care of. And this is a thing that's like used to be regular, a big band going and having everything done. And that doesn't happen a whole lot anymore, but you seek out to, to do this thing in this medium. Yeah. And, and not only that, but it's like progressive in a way, like it's very exploratory, but not in like a avant-garde kind of way. I mean, it's like my existence in the scene is progressive, which is probably enough of the problem. <laughs> I mean, I look real white, but like I, you know, I watched as the the number of women in my bands and programs dwindled drastically the further I went into into music and into rep bands and into education, right? And the fact that um, while, you know, privilege check, I'm super white passing and that's totally a fair read on me. Uh, I'm not, I'm half Japanese and that's super cool. Uh, The fact that I get to have the level of success that I do, which does include, yes, having toured a big band across Canada once upon a time, Uh, not without its hardships either. I, I am super lucky in that the people in my band are, they're the best, right? Um, in what I was saying before about like having friends that are very open and very supportive and very just like, just like good people that you want in your circle to deal with whatever comes your way. I feel very strongly that my band has the same thing going for them in spades, especially on these gigs. Right. Um, and when you're on the road with people for a long time, you can start to get on each other's nerves and it can start to be tense. That never happened. I've, I've been on tours where that's been hard, but with my band, it's always been fine. And that doesn't mean that we've agreed on everything or it's gone perfectly. It's just that the communication is there. Things are really easily resolved. We're all coming from this place of like, we want what is best for the band, for the tour. We want to like hang out with all these people that we like. We don't all need to like each other. In a 19 piece band, you don't need to hang out with everyone. Which is also kind of nice if you're, you know, I'm an introvert, uh, a bunch of my band members are introverts, uh, some of them are not. And that's like, it's this whole balance of ages and, yeah. and like, you know, genders. We have like a fairly diverse cast of people. There's about a 40 year age gap between the oldest and youngest members of the band. Like, that's really special and hard to find in the arts sometimes, especially here in Toronto, where that sort of generational intermingling doesn't happen nearly as often as it could but I think more importantly like I have the best of the best and as do a lot of people who are fortunate enough to be making music around Toronto as do you know if you're in an arts center across the world like you need to find your people and when you find your people a lot of those details start to take care of themselves right and I vividly remember my my last meeting I had a travel agent who helped me book large chunks of that tour um so I did all the sort of performance band managing who's staying with who we had a lot of like, if you have family in the city, you don't need to stay with the band. Cause then I don't have to pay for a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> right. And push a not, reunion. That's like, it's a bit of a write off. And- <laughs> that's, that's the family aspect, right? A right. lot of the, a lot of my bandmates were like, I think I'd like to stay with my parents. It's like, if I don't have to pay another hundred dollars a night, I love you, but yeah. I, I will take this discount. <laughs> um, and And so with that sort of level of communication openness, also like what is the minimum standard for what you need to come on this tour with me? That was all, I mean, that was all super out there, partly because it was public money going into this tour. Like you can Google and find out the amount of grant money I've gotten in the last few years. It's a lot. I am very lucky. Um, And then, yeah, having a band that was super on board and ready to do this adventure with me, having a travel agent that was, you know, able to help me navigate some of the difficulties there. Um, it was really funny sitting down at that last meeting and looking at the binder and, you know, my poor travel agent sitting on the other side being like, why are there only 10, like, why is there less rooms here than there are here? And why is this person not on? And I was just like, I have 18 other limbs that are my bandmates and I can tell you exactly where every one of them is supposed to be at any given time. (laughs) It's about a month out from tour. And so I'd been looking at this itinerary like over and over and over again. I was like, I think it'll be okay. (laughs) Um, And it was fine. It, 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 I mean, I am also lucky 
to circle back to the organizational thing, my brain works like that. It can stick things in boxes and it can figure out how this works together. And um, I'm really good with stuff like that, which is not a skill that a lot of other people have. And Mm -hmm. my advice really there is either get good or like find your person because you don't need to manage your own stuff. I mean, like it's, it's hard to say that now when we really are so independent, but you do want someone, if it's not you on your team, or helping you or whatever it is that is just crossing the T's and dotting the I's. Cause that is a skill that we lose the devil in details a lot of the time. And like, I don't want to be leaving my band member behind in Saskatchewan. Right. And I, 20 bucks, it would be Bruder <laughs> falling asleep <laughs> behind a bench or something. I'm just like, chasing a butterfly like somewhere said, with his they were all in their hotel rooms yeah. and if they weren't no one told me and i didn't yeah. know i i think that's the thing is like they're i mean touring as much as i have i i've toured with hooligan boys and and been on the road for some shenanigans but honestly they're pretty tame yeah. most of the time because when you tour when you tour a lot when you're in an uncomfortable car and you're sleeping on someone's floor you're and you're yeah <laughs> And everything hurts and like, you don't want to know who's been farting in the car for the past few hours, but that that's a thing. Yeah. Or like, <laughs> you know, you, you need your space away from people. And sometimes that's just sleep. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's really if it's, not, if it's, if it's, it's constant, not rock and roll. Uh, yeah. If it's constant performance too, you need time to recharge so you can give the next performance, the attention and the, and the passion that it deserves. Right. Like it's, People forget or alternatively just don't know how tiring a lot of this work is. Um, Being creative and working 40 hours a week is just about impossible because (laughs) it takes resources. It takes more resources than you put out. I mean, first of all, no one in an office is actually working a 40 hour a week. That is very unlikely. No way. Um, Even if they are though, right? The energy that goes into being creative is so much more than what is coming out there. And it's different. It doesn't just tire you out in the sense of like, my brain has been crunching numbers for eight hours. It's like, I have been pondering the nature of the universe and the (laughs) size and relationship of all things. And like, I need to go to bed, (laughs) right? It's a different kind of energy that goes into it. And it's a different kind of tired. And I, I think that is something that doesn't necessarily get recognized if you haven't had that creative aspect. It definitely doesn't because there, there's still all of the, um, I guess, traditional, work things being taken care of on top of the creativity aspect, which lights up your whole brain. Yeah. So it's like this, it's, you're doing a regular person's work on top of all this other stuff that has to come with it. And like, no wonder every musician just goes crazy or like has drug addiction or like whatever, like it's like, it, it burns you out like hard. And I think it's really interesting that, um, we're now getting to a point where we can talk about addictive behaviors in the mm-hmm. arts and mental health in the arts, because for a long time, it was that sort of very macho culture of like, you know, you have to put up and you have to push through. And like, as a woman in the industry, there's a lot of, there's a lot where it's just like, oh, you're just going to have to deal with this because you're a woman. It's like, yeah. ha- are we past this yet? Can we be past <laughs> this? Like, I feel this way. And I, have again, like, have been super lucky, have not faced, you know, nearly the, the worst depths of the horrors that are still out there. Um, and part of that is choosing your people and having a good instinct, but a good instinct is learned as much as it is just like in your body too. Right. right? Um, I have not seen the worst of the worst. I will not pretend to have seen the worst of the worst, but even I am standing here. Like, can we be done with this yet? Well, I would like my existence to not it's 2020. Be an it's like, we've, we've seen all the stories we've heard it all. And we've gone back. We have enough distance between us and the not so distant past of like music history to hear all of these stories about people and hear experiences on on every degree of the spectrum and be like, okay, there's a, there's a lot more we need to be open about and we need to deal with. And, and it's just, I, I know I've seen a lot of your, your posts um, in the past where you were just straight up calling out ridiculous sexist situations that you have encountered, whether it's just like 
you know, on the city bus or whether it's in like a working situation. Like I think yeah. one of them was um, where it was like the, nobody would introduce a woman unless it was like the lovely so-and-so. And it was always somehow like there, there's, there's like a sexuality or a physical uh, look tied to you as a person instead of like, here's this soloist about to rip your face off with musical <laughs> talent. It's always like, well, yeah. they got a dress on. Here's the lovely so-and-so. And, uh, and like, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's been a thing for a while. That actually is a story from when I was in high school, not from my high school. Um, but there was a band in a neighboring school, neighboring school, neighboring school district. And they had one girl that played all the solos and she was amazing uh and super cool uh and her teacher without fail every single time introduced her as the lovely and talented and I started using that on the guys in my band because I was just like whoa like no I mean <laughs> like don't get me wrong she is she is lovely and was then and is talented and was then and she also worked her butt off and did then and like this this never by leading with what we look like and all of that, it just, it invalidates all this shit we're trying to do. Like yeah. we're here, we're working. Um, and that's, that's the problem with the industry as it has been and still is in a lot of ways is it's like, oh, if you're not like, I mean, you could expand this to the world in general, but it's like, oh, if you're not a white dude, then like, did you really work for it? And it's like, yeah, probably. And yeah. then on top of that, probably dealt with a lot of discrimination along the way or, or dealt with being told that you aren't welcome or dealt with, you know, uh, open hostility mm -hmm. in some ways dealt with being mistaken for other people in like a not cool, racist, subconscious way. And I think people are like, oh, but that's not so bad. It's like, yeah, it's not so bad if it happens to you once, right? Like in my entire time at Humber, I got mistaken for another girl like one time and that was, that was fine, right? Like we were friends. We kind of looked alike. This kid had no idea what he was talking about. It was totally an innocent mistake. Yeah. But if that happens to you once a week, you're like, do you even, can you even tell the difference? Like, you, you know, that like I wear glasses and she does, like, <laughs> like they're just not looking at you. Right. And the idea with all the, all the stuff that has been happening lately is like, we need to actually look at each other and like take that seriously. We're all people. We're all just trying to do our thing and get by and like, in whatever form that takes. But the problem is that we have collectively been pretty terrible to, a lot of people, the majority of people, yeah. really, if we like filter <laughs> out like anyone who is like not cis and white and male, uh, <laughs> right. And straight, the like, th that's most of the population. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a lot of people. And, and you also have cis and white dudes that are like, Hey, this happened to me too. It's like, yeah. wow, can we just stop with all of this? Like this yeah. isn't helping anybody. <laughs> what we're doing is we're creating this culture where it's like, oh, we're going to make people feel unwelcome. And the move that I think we are slowly, but slowly, but surely making, I would hope is that we're trying to make a world where everyone is welcome. Right. Yeah. And that is going to happen in fits and starts and it's going to be tough. But like, I want a music scene where like, where we can have all of this, where we can have thinky jazz and, uh, experimental new music that borders on theater and pop music and made by anybody, right? By like our black trans pals, by our, <laughs> you know, super queer friendos. And like, again, I check a lot of privilege boxes. I am one to talk, but the whole scene, music, the world in general is better when we have diverse voices because we have perspectives that like, you know, me and my comfy little box and my comfy little house, like, that's there. I don't know. I could use some more influences from people that I don't look like. I think that's good for everybody. Like, I think it's just good for, for culture and for understanding and for making a world where we can all actually just make art in. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Um, well, I mean, we're, we're just at about an hour. So I, I, and we've hopped around and it's been, very intriguing, engaging. <laughs> We're checking off all these boxes pretty naturally that I was like, I want to get to this, 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 and this. And so that makes me happy is I just kind of get to sit back and all right, yeah, do your thing. <laughs> do your thing. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, if you want to give one last round of like anything you're 
you're plugging or you want to send people in a certain direction and be like, check this out, please. <laughs> I am on the internet at www.crymmusic.com. That's crymmusic.com. Uh, I am on Bandcamp at crymmusic.com. I am on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at crymmusic. Um, I don't have anything on the go right now because I am taking advantage of this pandemic time to write some music and do Hit some the things shed. That I, yeah, <laughs> practice, play. I'm learning ukulele. It's not going. It's it's going just fine. Hey, um, it's it's out like, there and it's happening. So that's that's something is, that's like that's a new skill I got. <laughs> it's it's person time right now. I'm taking right. advantage of this this uh, time where I still have a little bit of money and savings and nothing to do to just like do me for a bit. So uh, there isn't a lot going on, but when things do start to open up and get busy again, that's where you will find the happenings. <laughs> Excellent. Well, be sure to send, I'll post links and everything with when this goes up and everybody will be able to find you wherever this ends up, probably in the South Pacific garbage patch somewhere. Uh, <laughs> the but- GPGP. <laughs> <laughs> But I really, really appreciate you uh, sacrificing some of your valuable time to sit and just chat about music life uh, with me. Because the whole purpose of M-File and everything we're trying to do with this is just talk more about music and all the little things that go into it. Because there's a lot. And there hopefully lot. any any part of a conversation that we have or any part of a post or anything that turns that light bulb on for somebody and is like, okay, yeah, I can do this. Then that's a win. That's a win. (laughs) You know, like, I love it. So yeah. Thank you very much. And, uh, take care and stay safe and stay very, very, very busy. (laughs) Cause (laughs) it seems like you, (laughs) you, you totally thrive on the busy. (laughs) I do my best. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Okay. Awesome. If you want to learn more about any of the topics discussed on today's episode, or if you'd like to expand your horizons so you can make the most amount of impact with your music, please be sure to check us out at mfile.ca.